So can we all hold up your Bibles or whatever you use for a Bible, a phone, iPad, old school paper book Bible, which I probably don't see those anywhere. So we can say, this is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. So I open my heart today to hear God speak a word that will change my life forever. All right, Pastor Kean. 
Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> All right. We're going to jump right back into which teaching? Who remembers? Part one. And then I kind of give you like a, like a Sephora, right? And then I said something about, man, what's, what's going to happen? Huh? What's going to happen? The biggest twist in the Bible. Remember I said that? Anyone remember that? And we'll find out what that twist is in the Bible. But anyway, you're correct. This is part two and the last part of uh, Moses and Sephora. And we've been in the teaching series title, Divinely Human. God used us. And I quote a quote from Dallas Willard last week. Anyone of you remember? Is, uh, basically, it says, of course. God used imperfect people because that's all there is on this earth, right? So uh, you can look uh, to the person to the left and to the right sitting next to you and tell them, be thankful that you are imperfect. <laughs> but of course, that's not an excuse <laughs> to treat each other imperfectly, right? <laughs> so let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your words today. And Lord, uh, help us once again, Lord, to, to see that we are a partaker of the divine nature that you have given to us, Lord God, that it is you who is in us, Lord, that we must live by. And we thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week, basically, we, we started to talk about Moses, right? And uh, first off was the miracle that happened to him, the fact that he was saved, right? Meanwhile, most of the children, Pharaoh wanted to kill the children of the Hebrews, right? So he was miraculously saved. And then he killed an Egyptian, and we would talk about how through Acts chapter 7, he think that he could deliver his people by killing an Egyptian and probably will do that one Egyptian at a time. So, so in comparison to how we see the world and reaching the world, oftentimes we get stuck into thinking that we can only do something one person at a time versus ministering to a whole family, to the whole church with the gift that God has given to us. So how God wants to operate is indeed a miracle. We can never understand how he works. In our mind is, I'm, I've been praying for this person, and I can't minister to anyone else because I'm focusing on this person, and you're waiting for that right moment. It has been 20 years already. You're still waiting, right? Meanwhile, God is saying, no, I have given you. I have equipped you. I have imparted to you gifts and talent to be able to minister to not just that one person, but many, many people. So we first, uh, and we've been learning and reminding ourselves, we can't discount ourselves. We can't look at our, our failures, our frailty, our fear, and say, God, you can't use me. L look at what I've done. Look at what I'm doing. Look at how I'm, I'm living right now. Look at my, my, my priorities in life right now. You are not first in my life. You know, those things will come. And the enemy will use those things to cause us to feel so bad about ourselves, to feel guilty about ourselves, where we're saying, that's not for me. I'm not up to that. The bar is too high. It's just me. I'm going to do my best, and if opportunities come to help people out, you know, hopefully I'm ready. But otherwise, I'll just live for me. And that's how the enemy works, right? He might not take you out, but he'll keep you in the mindset that, you know, just worry about yourself for now. The opportunities will come. Well, God is saying the opportunities are here. 
for you to help people, to stop people and say, hey, can I pray for you? I believe in a God that heals. I believe in a God that comforts. I believe in a God that delivers. Let me pray for you. So, um, and lastly, we talked about Moses, how he discounted himself, right? How he's, he's not very good with words, right? When, when, when the Lord God called him to go and speak to Pharaoh, the first thing, he, his excuse was, I can't speak. But then we look into God's word, Acts 7, verse 22. It says, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of, Egypt, of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So we see that the word of God actually described him differently than he described himself. I can't speak. How many times have we, out of our own mouths, say that we can't do something? A lot. All of our hands should be raised. <laughs> that was a test. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but when you look into God's word, just like we did for the sake of Moses, that scripture is God's word. It came later, thousands of years later. But it speaks of him as one that has mighty in words and deeds. So what you believe about yourself might not be what the Bible says about, your, about you. So make sure you read the word of God. That's where the truth is. Because if you don't, then you buy into the lies and you get stuck in life, not fulfilling what God has called you to. So now we continue in Exodus 4. Verse 18 to 19. Let's read loudly together. You see the uh, scripture here. Let's read. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go, return to Egypt, for all the men who sought your life are dead. Right? Right? Remember, he ran away. He killed an Egyptian. So he's been away for 40 years. It's almost like you think about it took him 40 years to gather, just spending time with the Lord and understanding that what God sees in me is different than what I see in myself. And it looks like he comes to the point after 40 years, he believed he's ready to go back to Egypt, okay? So we pick up there, and this is where the big twist is. So now Moses is ready to go back to Egypt and deliver God's people out of Egypt. Exodus 4, 24. Let's read this together. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Okay, let's stop right here. It seems like God's been working on Moses' confidence, right? And here Moses is ready, right? He say, okay, I'm ready to go back to Egypt. I'm ready to do what you call me to do, to deliver your people out of Egypt. The twist is, if God has had prepared him all these time, why all of a sudden he sought to kill Moses? Why? That's a big twist, isn't it? It seems like he finally get it, you know, the plan of God for him. And God came and sought to kill him. But if you can imagine for a second who Moses is in the Old Testament. He's a type of Christ, right? The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus in the New Testament, right? The most central figure of the Old Testament is Moses. And 
the old covenant came through Moses. The new covenant came through Jesus. And in fact, in, in the book of Hebrews, they contradict one another, right? It's that time, now is the new covenant, the way of Jesus. So why did God want to kill Moses then, if he's such a central figure in the Old Testament? Well, let's read here, Exodus 4, 25, 26. It will reveal something to us here. Then Zephora took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. Wait, let me read that again. Surely you are a husband of blood to me. It was a very emotional and bloody scene. Right? Okay. Let me reveal something to you here. His son at this time is in their 30s. Okay? Um, I don't know what went on. <laughs> okay? Uh, either the son volunteered or they knocked him out or <laughs> whatever, right? But he was circumcised at 30. Okay? So he, uh, surely you are a husband of blood to me. So he, capital H here, let him go. So God sought to kill Moses, and now what happened? Cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet. Was there an agreement between Moses and Zephora at this point? You know, one can infer that probably not, because if there was an agreement, then maybe she said, hey, Moses, uh, I notice God is about to take you out. Uh, honey, can you come in? Come here? And they go into the tent and they discuss some things. They, they look at their son and their son's like, why are you looking at us? You know, they're two sons, right? And, uh, and then next thing you know, you know, he goes out. And did they rehearse her throwing at his feet, the foreskin? No. It was something that was not discussed. It was something that came to mind, to Zephora mind. I think this is the issue here, right? So Moses was going to go back to Egypt, and he was going to reinstitute circumcision, right, which is a sign of covenant. Back then, it's a sign of salvation for God's people, circumcision. But for the New Testament, it's the circumcision of the heart, when you put, have faith in God, God cut our flesh, the, the flesh, the body, the parts that's sinful, right? It, and in Colossians chapter 2, we're not going to read it, but it relates that with baptism, water baptism, right? You go down in the water, your old self died, and you come out a new person. So cutting the foreskin in a way for the New Testament, it is the circumcision of the heart, okay? So, apparently, Moses may have told Sephora about circumcision, but he didn't teach her, okay? And the fact that he was about to go back to Egypt and reinstitute circumcision, but he did not practice that. So, he did not walk what he preached, so Sephora, by the leading of the Lord, I believe, caught on to this and say, you can't go. You're about to reinstitute circumcision, but you have not practiced that within your own family. So that's why God sought to kill him. At this point, it's interesting because it was very emotional. As I mentioned, it's almost like an, as far as like, how, how could you forget? And she threw it at his feet. So some people read this part thinking that, perceiving that Moses did something and he missed it, right? Again, this is his human side. He missed things, right? Sephora caught on and it tells us that how important our family is to our ministry. 
You know, when you do the work of the Lord, sometimes you, you don't see your blind spot. But your spouse, they see it. And God used them. Or sometimes it's your sibling. Sometimes it's your parent. You do the work of the ministry, but there, there's something you need to be aware of, but you, you can't see it until somebody got used in your family to say, hey, make sure you take into account this. And that's what Sephora did, right? And um, so there's two sides to this story that you can see. One side is our families is very important. It's an integral part to our ministry, which we see here, right? Sephora spoke up and did what she needed to do and threw it at at Moses' feet, and that saved them. On the other side is that after this point, Moses separated himself from Sephora and his children, and he went off to Egypt, and he did all the mighty works God did for the people of Israel, the ten plagues, remember that? And deliver God's people. He did all that without Sephora being there, without his son being there. So it's like, how can there be ministry so powerful and yet your family who's important to you not there, not being there with you? Well, you can argue that maybe it was too dangerous, you know, and he didn't want them to come along. Okay, I buy that because it's not very clear what happened, right? But when I read this, I realize that there is a group of people among our population, unfortunately, 50% of married couple end up in divorce, family broken, you know, there's separation, right? But that does not mean the end. That does not mean the end. That does not mean because you have a divorce, you're separate, does not mean that's it. It's over. God cannot use you. Remember, God is a forgiving God, right? Do you agree? God forgives? Yes? (laughs) Yes? <laughs> He's a forgiving God. So if somebody went through a divorce, somebody went through a separation, is it hopeless for them? What if they recognize their mistake? What if they say, Lord, I, I screw up, I mess up? And, you, of course, the spouse moved on already, had their own family, and now, what, is that it? I'm going to discount myself for the rest of my life because of that mistake. So, you know, you can look at this story and say, was there a separation between Moses and Zephora? We don't know. The Bible is not clear about that. But physically, they were separated because she was not there. Her children was not there with Moses when he went to Egypt, right? So, so my point is, you do not want to be circumcised in your 30s and especially, you do not want your mom to do it. Right? That's my point. Of course, that's not my point, right? <laughs> um, my point is, no matter what you face in life, if you come back before the Lord, he will use you. He will use you. Use you. So now we see here, um, look at Exodus 18, verse 1 to 3 and verse 5 to 6. This is after he came back, okay? After the miracles that God did in Egypt. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard. He heard. He wasn't there. He heard of all that God had done for Moses and for, his, for Israel, for his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Sephora, right, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back with her two sons. And verse 5, And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I your father-in-law Jethro am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So 
Jethro probably think that I'm too old for this. Why am I taking care of my daughter and my grandson? Moses, take your wife and your sons back. You know, I gave her away. Why is she still here with me? <laughs> right? Um, oh, a funny story. Speaking of giving away, right? I had a chance to give away my daughter uh, in marriage. Um, there was a story. This is a true story, okay? A pastor who presided over this wedding and um, the father of the bride, he was so nervous. He was pacing back and forth. And, uh, and the pastor is telling him, it's okay. It's going to be a great day. You're going to do fine. You just have four words to memorize. That's it. We're not asking you to pray. We're not asking you to sing. We just ask you to say these four words. When I cue you, just say the four words. My, I mean, her mother and I, right? Anyone familiar with those four words? Her mother and I, right? I, I you know, I think I did that. I remember I did that, <laughs> okay? Her mother and I, right? Her mother and I. Four words, that's it. So, you know, rehearsal, rehearsal dinner. He's pacing back and forth, and he's trying to memorize his four words. Her mother and I, her mother and I, her mother and I. So the ceremony came, and so the pastor did his thing, and then the time came, the cue came. He looked directly at the father of the bride, almost like, you can do this, you know, with his facial expression. And the father opened his mouth and said, my mother and I. And, oh, the whole crowd busted it and laughing. It's a true story. All right. Exodus 18.8. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done. So he basically shared the miracle that happened, right? All that has been done. So besides Jethro and uh, Zephora and the Tucson was not there to witness the miracle, but they believe. They believe what Moses said, right? They believe. Well, another funny story, um, there are people, even in Bible school, who tend to explain miracles away, okay? So this is one of the story. It's a funny story. It's a true story. It was in a seminary, Old Testament class. There was a liberal professor always trying to explain away all the miracles using science, right? Science. Uh, ever heard of that? I believe in science, right? All right. So one student who was very conservative would always argue with him. One day, the professor explained that parting the Red Sea happened before a major drought, which caused the water level to drop to six inches. Okay. All right. That's science, right? Um, so, he's, uh, so he said, so, you know, the parting of the Red Sea was really not a miracle, right? Six inches. So that student, that conservative student, would let out a big ha! You know, he let out a couple of times as he was talking. So the professor finally turned to him and said, do you like to add something to what I just said, right? He said, yes, of course, right? So the student said that it was more of a miracle because the Egyptian soldier drowned in six inches of water. Okay, so that was the miracle, all right? And so uh, it's amazing uh, that uh, some people try to explain the miracle in the Bible as a way. So anyway, Moses had problem basically um, with himself. We covered that. And he had problem with his family, right? So all of us has been, been through that and continue to have problems, right? That's our imperfect life, right? Now we look at Moses has problems with his brother and sister, okay? Anybody here um, has problem with your brothers, sisters, and your family? Anyone have problems? Yeah, everybody should raise your hand if you have sibling, right? <laughs> All right, so Numbers 12, verse 1 to 2 says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. Okay, 
let me read on here. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? So, and the Lord heard it. Okay, I'm not sure why Miriam brought in the fact that Moses was married to an Ethiopian woman here. Do you see why? Has nothing to do, right? Her quorum was, was that, uh, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has nothing to do with Sephora being an Ethiopian. Uh, in a way, it tells us that uh, sometimes when people complain about some things, they're really mad about something else, right? They'll complain about something, but they're really mad at something else, and they will not tell you until maybe later on. But anyway, we see here that they were complaining about Moses. But the last part of that scripture was that, and the Lord heard it. And the Lord heard it. There are times in our lives where people complaining about us, criticizing us. And do not be deceived. God hears that, okay? God's not deaf to that. We might not see him around, but he hears these things. When people come against you, God knows, okay? God knows. So Numbers 12, 4 says, Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle meeting, right? So the three came out, right? Basically, go to my room, right? All three of you, right? I'll take care of you, you know, in there, right? So they, they come outside, and, and um, Numbers 12, 5, 8, let's, let's read this together. This is really good, okay? And I pray that it minister to you. If you ever feel like, you know, you being attacked, someone criticizing you, complaining about you, may this minister to you. Then the Lord came. Let's read together loudly. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make himself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Wow. That's amazing. Right? Even with Moses, you know, mistakes and all that, God still defended defend him. Because he was obedient, he was faithful to the things the Lord had called him to do. So he was God's instrument, right, to unleash those ten plagues in Egypt and delivering God's people out of Egypt, right? And God stood by him. So when you become a part of the body of Christ, part of a church, right, part of the way of God, you don't have to defend yourself anymore. He will do that for you, okay? He will defend you. God will still use in a great, mighty way, right, as long as you put your trust in him. Even if you have fears, you have failures, your frailties, things that, you know, the enemy will tie time after time to make you discount yourself. So let's end here with Psalm 5, verse 11 to 12. Basically, reinforce, reminding us that God does defend us, okay? When he gives us favor, that's how he does it. Okay, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who love your name be joyful in you, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. Can we stand? So you see here, he blessed the righteous. In the New Testament, righteousness comes from Jesus. It's not what we do. We cannot earn righteousness. You can... 
do all the volunteer work, help someone out constantly. But the righteousness comes from Jesus when we put our faith in him. Remember, he imputed for us, right? He puts into our, our account the righteousness of God. And then he takes sin from our account and put it in Jesus' account. So the sin that we have is in Jesus' account. When you confess your sin, he will forgive you your sin. So let's pray right now. And I feel like we should be very thankful in our prayer, right? So I'm gonna, there's three points I want you to, to be thankful for as you pray. First is be thankful for your family and their part in your calling. Be thankful for your family and their part in your ministry. Second, be thankful for second chances. You know, some of us have messed up, have screwed up. But when we come back to the Lord, he's giving you a second chance, okay? And thirdly, be thankful that he defends you when others might not. You know, sometimes we look around. We look around for people to cheer us on. We look around to family members, to friends, to speak up on our behalf because we don't want to. We're, we're, we're directly involved. Well, don't worry about that. The Lord will defend you. So, Lord, we pray that these words, Lord, we hear today will be with us to remind us that your plan for us is for peace, not for evil, to give us hope and a future, Lord God. So we thank you. Lord, I pray over my brothers and sisters, Lord God. May they be encouraged today. May they only look back to learn from their mistake, but not to hold on to those mistakes. May they be free knowing that you defend them because they put their trust in you, because they are obedient to you. So, Lord, help us, even with our humanities, Lord God, to be partaker of the divine nature that we would think of others first before ourselves. Thank you, Lord. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.